Hello and uh, welcome to another uh, one of the BSR podcasts today. We're going to be talking to you about the Sjogren's Syndrome guidelines and uh, we have some experts with us in the room. Um, I'll start with the introductions. My name is Noam Mikari. I'm the editor in chief of the Journal of Rheumatology. I'll introduce you to uh, our experts who will be chatting with us this, this today. And um, we'll start off with Liz. Liz. Hi, I'm Liz Price. I'm a consultant rheumatologist at the Great Western Hospital in Swindon. I've got a clinical interest in Sjogren's syndrome. Hi, I'm Kosiana Turkin. I'm a professor of rheumatology at UCL and I'm a consultant in adolescent and adult rheumatology with interest in Sjogren. Hello, my name's Bridget Crampton and I lead the helpline team at Sjogren's UK. Um, and I also have Sjogren's myself. I've had it for 20 years now. Okay, well, welcome all to the podcast. And um, we really sort of like are trying to discuss really the most recent update to the guidelines and what's new in it. So let's start off with a brief summary. Liz, can you tell us what, what's in the guideline and what's new, please? Okay, so, so the original guideline was published in 2017 and things move on very rapidly. So the update, we've approached in a slightly different way. So in the old guideline, we went eyes, mags and so forth and just worked our way through bits of the, of, of, of the um, systemic effects, if you like, of the Sjogren syndrome. This time, we posed questions that we felt needed to be asked. So what, what we actually did was the guideline working group got together and came up with a set of 19 questions. Um, and then we interrogated the literature and we've come up with the answers and used that to develop our recommendations. We've broadened the guideline. So this time we've included a lot more that wasn't in the original guideline, including for the first time adolescence, um, uh, advice on adolescence, and Cosiana has been instrumental in that. And the idea of the guideline is that it's to enable the non-specialist rheumatologist to manage a patient with Sherbins in the best possible way, looking at the important things, making sure they do all the little things well, they treat the eyes, they treat the mouth, they think of the holistic patient, they look at what blood tests they should be looking at, and really to guide um, the rheumatologist or the specialist nurse or whoever's looking after them to do the best way of managing these guidelines to make sure that the patient gets um, a holistic um, treatment and management um, in the best possible way. Okay, well that's, that's interesting because yeah, what about in patients of pediatric and adolescents? Is there anything new there to report from the guidelines? Yes, I think what the British Society of Rheumatology proposed here is, is a first at the international level, and I think this is terribly relevant. There is no other guideline that looks at Sjogren's disease or Sjogren's syndrome across age. That means for the first time we recognise that there is an underdiagnosed and possibly underrecognized disease phenotype that starts in younger patients. And also that they present slightly differently and they may have different needs. And also we need to support our clinicians and the light health professionals in diagnosing and looking after them. That means there are a few mis uh, new things there. First, quite reassuring that even if there is research around novel autoantibodies, they don't help diagnosis. That means we are reassured as NHS clinicians that whatever we do routinely in our clinics, testing for anti raw anti antibodies, rheumatoid factor, ANA is likely to be sufficient. There is some evidence that we can use ultrasound and we can use it targeting different salivary glands. We can look at the parotid glands or the submandibular glands and that can help the diagnosis and also that doing biopsies is reasonably safe in children as well. And the biopsies may need to be targeted according to their involvement. There is some update on medication and we've been quite careful to try to map the evidence, which unfortunately is not very, very strong because there are very few studies. And as we know from adults, there is absolutely no licensed medication. However, there are some uh, updates. Specifically, we have access to cyclosporine. If uh, patients, younger patients have very severe eye dryness, we can use that in the UK now from age four. And that wasn't available a few years ago. Also, the fact that we have some guidelines that are targeted to the recurrent parotitis. Recurrent parotitis is the most common manifestation of the young people. That means understanding the way we can treat them is uh, terribly relevant. And also we looked at the evidence we have about using conventional and biologic DMARTs across the world, uh, using information that was provided by our American colleagues who surveyed their practice. And we know that there are some um, agents that can be used in, in, in children and we map this across the guideline. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you. So um, that it, it's really interesting. This is actually the first in, in children. And Bridget, from a patient point of view, I, I mean, what do you think this will provide? What will the patients get from this? I, I think it's great for patients that, that we have guidelines like this. I think it means that the, all clinicians can easily access 
information and actually knowledge, I think, by my experience, I find knowledge is, is a little bit patchy in, in places. So not everyone is able to, to access good care or people don't have the knowledge to direct them to, to the right specialists. And I think it will help them to access that. So that will be great for patients. I, th I think also that it's good that patients can access it themselves. It will, it will help them make better use of their own appointments. So they'll know what treatments might be offered. They'll know what they want to talk about at their appointments. And, and at this moment in time, appointments are precious time. They don't want to waste it. They want to, to know what they want to talk about. So, and I think it really helps patients to do that. But it's great for clinicians too, to access this information. And my hope is it might standardize care across the UK a little bit more and, and you know, iron out some of this patchiness. I think it's worth saying, Marwan, that one of the issues that I come across in the patients that come to see me for a second opinion is that very often the little things haven't been done well. So I think people make the diagnosis of Sjögren's and then give them hydroxychloroquine and send them away. And people don't think about managing their eye disease, managing their mouth disease, managing the dryness, the vaginal dryness and so forth. And I think the trouble with Sjögren's is there isn't a single treatment that suits everyone. You have to you really have to personalise the care and you have to go. Through, it is a bit tedious, but you do have to go through all the little bits. And actually, the one thing that I try and teach the registrars is actually ask the patients about their dry eyes, ask them what drops they're using and what frequency they're using. And it's something that is a bit out of the comfort zone for rheumatologists. So if we can get across to rheumatologists, particularly, this is a systemic disease that affects different parts of the system and get, make them think, have I asked the right questions? Am I referring them in the right direction? Do they need to see a specialist dentist, for instance? Do they need an ophthalmology review to start ICOVIS and cyphosporin eye drops? That sort of thing. I think that is really valuable. I think rheumatologists get very, very focused on immunomodulation. And we know that the evidence for immunomodulation in Sherman's is not good. And we do use it, but actually that isn't your first line of defence in this condition. You've got to do the simple things first. And I think we forget that sometimes. I think that's really important. And it goes back, Liz, to you talking about a holistic approach. Mm. And I think living with Sherwin's, it's what, it's what we need most, really. And the things that make life difficult with Sherwin's are often um, a, a, a collection of small things, really, that you live with day in, day out. Um, and you do need support in finding what is available to help you with those. So I think, yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think you've mentioned uh, you've mentioned benchmarking and everything else. I'm hoping that the audit there is an audit tool that goes with it, so that people can actually look at how they manage Sjogren's and and mm -hmm. that will help everybody manage it better. Is that correct? Yes, yes, absolutely. So, so the idea of the audit tool is it, it, help, it reminds you, um, am I making the diagnosis correctly? Um, and although we know that ultrasound is phenomenally helpful, it isn't yet part of the diagnostic criteria. So really for a, a cast iron diagnosis, you need to have done the antibodies and or the biopsy. Um, and then if you look at the order of the things in the audit tool, the simple things are at the top. You know, have you prescribed eye drops four times a day? The very basic stuff that, that I think we often forget. Well, that's brilliant. So I think we've got some fairly interesting data here and we've got something new and we've got somewhere to signpost people to when they log on to Google and the search engines or they go to the BSR website or the Versus Arthritis website or, or, or the Sjogren's UK website. Hopefully they'll be able to get through to there. Do you have any final um, things that you might want to mention about the guidelines that you haven't mentioned before? Well, I hope it raises awareness that this is a disease that can affect the ages. I think it's often not thought about in younger people and it's often not thought about in men. So I think those are two things that I would want to highlight. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think also it's important um, that it, it lays out the different things that can happen with Sjögren's. It doesn't always present in the same way. I think a lot of people who know a little bit about Sjögren's think in terms of dryness, but sometimes that's not what we see first and it can get missed then. So I, I'm hoping that it brings all this information together and, and diagnosis will maybe speed up, which would be great. Okay, yeah. Yeah, 
Yes, I, I fully agree with this, and I think uh, Bridget's view is is really really relevant. Uh, according to age, they can have different manifestation, but I feel the guidelines helps us as clinicians to try to stratify our patients and also identify different phenotypes. Think about them in a slightly different way in terms of way, the way we approach their their treatment and discussing about the risk of lymphoma. I think the guidance provides a lot of evidence around that. How we try to to map different kind of a presentations that will lead to more extra glandular manifestation. Manifestations, and those will be the refractory cases where we may need to escalate therapy. But also looking at the evidence about the benefits of hydroxychloroquine, I think having that critical appraisal the treatment that we've been using for so many years, put it into the context of real benefits and evidence base, I think that's very, very useful as well. And the practical advice, I valued, uh, I always value a guideline that has non pharmacological kind of recommendations, and I think it's really good to look into that, as well as the information we can provide to our patients. To, to support them to self-manage. Just two final points from me. One is that in the course of doing the guidelines and the revision process, we looked at changing the name from Sjogren's syndrome to Sjogren's disease. And we've had feedback from the Europeans and from the patients that they preferred the name of disease as it changed the emphasis of the condition. Um, and there is a move away from eponymous syndromes. So um, we have in this guideline referred to it as Sjogren disease. I think in time we might lose the disease as well and it might just become Sjogren, but we felt it was a little bit too early to do that. And then finally, um, you will know that the BSR have extended the ca data capture for the NEAR audit this year um, and are including patients with newly diagnosed CTD, including Sjogren. So a plea from me, we really do not know the instance of this condition across the UK. If you can put all your newly diagnosed Sjogren's patients into the audit, that will help us tremendously. Can I urge you to use the most modern criteria, which, is, which are referred to in the guidelines, the ACR um, ULR combined 2016 criteria. Um, the first author on that paper is Shibosh Giatal, if you need to look it up. But if you look at the audit tool that goes along with the guideline, the first item in the audit tool is, have you met the guidelines? There's a little tick box for you to do. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you all very much. So uh, just on behalf of the BSR, thank you very much, Liz. Thank you, Kasianika. Thank you, Bridget, for the time. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about this in a few more years' time when you have more data to show us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.